This is Media Center Ukraine, and my name is Vadim Krasnolki. I'm very delighted to welcome all the journalists who have joined us here today to spread the truth about the war in Ukraine. Easter is the largest Christian holiday with ancient traditions and with a special procedure for the church service. But unfortunately, there are certain adjustments that we have to make because of the war time. So today we will be talking about what is be, will be different this year and how exactly the Easter celebration will be taking place. So we will be talking to the representatives of the clergy and authorities. And first of all, I want to invite up here Mr. Yevhen Boyko, Mayor's Chief of Staff. Yevhen, tell us what the difference will be this year. Good afternoon, dear colleagues. Thank you for this opportunity to share some information pertaining to the organization of Easter celebrations in the city of Lviv. Christ's resurrection this year will take place during the second month of the Russia-Ukraine war and it's symbolic that the enemy prepared Golgoth for us while we will be celebrating the resurrection of Christ. I would like to walk you through some practicalities. We have uh, approved the curfew rules and regulations. This is something that has been devolved to us from the national government. The curfew in Lviv is from 11 p.m. until 6 a.m. So we will not have the traditional Easter night vigil in our churches. This is unprecedented for the city of Lviv because uh, nightly church services on Easter are very popular. They are part and parcel of our tradition. And this is something that is indispensable for the religious consciousness uh, of the Lviv residents. This is the decision that we have discussed with all the leaders of the religious denominations in the city of Lviv, with the Orthodox Church, with the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, and all these clergy representatives see eye to eye. So all the church services will be over before the beginning of the curfew. And then the morning church services will start after 6 a.m. Considering the ongoing war in Ukraine and considering the volatile nature of the situation, the recommendation to the locals is to plan their time meticulously because these recommendations will definitely be heeded by all the church representatives. If there is an air raid alert during a church service, um, if there is a threat of airstrikes, then the church clergy will advise the faithful to seek shelter in the nearest bomb shelter. And they will also provide the relevant instructions and guidelines to all the faithful. Vigilance is key right now because uh, we have seen since the outbreak of the war that there's nothing sacred for the enemy. Now I want to briefly elucidate some other things associated with Easter celebrations. Cemeteries will be operating as per regular schedule because we have this tradition of visiting the deceased at cemeteries. With regard to public transportation, on Sunday, public buses will start running right after the completion of the curfew. So people will be able to make it to the morning church service. Trolley buses will also start running at 6 o'clock in the morning. And on Saturday night, public transportation will be running almost until the beginning of the curfew. A couple of words about traditional celebrations. There will be certain changes this year. In the past, we had some festivities in the Shevchenko Grove 
but this year the festivities will be more modest and the focus will be more on local events, especially in those neighborhoods and facilities where we have refugees. And I have a big request for parents and children to participate in those events. A little bit about discipline. You know that uh, hard alcohol is prohibited in Lviv. Um, only alcohol produced by fermentation and brewing is allowed. And this is something that is allowed from noon till 8 p.m. But uh, alcohol consumption at summer terraces and uh, is forbidden. We have uh, discussed the safety and security aspects with all the law enforcement bodies. We will have reinforced patrols over the weekend. Some National Guard representatives will also be deployed throughout the city. So as you can see, the issue of security is on top of our agenda. I would like to talk separately about IDPs. A lot of these refugees are accommodated in schools and other public institutions, so we will have some Easter celebrations there as well. We will engage local priests and they will go to refugee accommodation places because we want these people to be exposed to Easter celebrations as well. Besides, together with our cultural institutions, we will conduct some Easter bread baking masterclasses and trainings because we want to preserve the Easter spirit and we want to pass on these traditions to those people who are not familiar with these traditions. We will also have some events taking place in the municipal library, not Khotkevich Palace, the Chamber Music House, a number of events will be organized by the Ukrainian Academy of Leadership and the Museum of uh, Ruszewski in Lviv will also host uh, a number of events. So I would like to wish you a happy Easter. I really hope that you will have peace and quiet in your hearts and I really hope that we will be able to obtain a quick victory. Are there any questions to Yvonne? The information you have provided is very comprehensive and detailed. That's why I guess there are no questions. Thank you very much, Yevhen. We've had Yevhen Boyko, Mayor's Chief of Staff, with us. And now I want to invite up here some clergy representatives. We have Mr. Pavlo Drozak here, Chaplain of Lviv City Council and Press Secretary of Lviv Eparchy of the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. And Mr. Mikhailo Sevak, the key holder of the St. Pokrova Cathedral of the Ukrainian Orthodox Church. Thank you for being with us. I have the same question to you. What are some of the changes that we should expect on Easter this year in comparison with the past? Glory to Jesus Christ, dear friends, this year. We will be celebrating Easter under new conditions during wartime. We have already received some information on the household issues pertaining to Easter celebrations, but I would like to elucidate the Easter meaning of the holiday. This meaning remains intact. During wartime, the celebration of Easter is particularly inspirational and relevant because Easter is about the victory of Jesus Christ over death. It's about the victory of the good over the evil, and it's about the victory of light over darkness. When we celebrate Easter, we have to realize that even though we are struggling, even though we are experiencing some dire times, the good and the truth will always prevail. And since we are siding with the truth, since we are defending our homes, our families, our country, we will definitely win 
because as I have already mentioned, we are siding with the good. So this year's Easter has to be even more inspirational and nurturing than always. Mr. Pavel Drezak, glory to our unconquerable God and glory to Ukraine. Our God cannot be conquered because uh, he has already defeated death. This is the truth that has been deeply grounded in our culture. This is the news that you cannot call a fake. Um, Jesus Christ is eternal and uh, without him, our faith would be to no available. For several years, the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church has not been able to have a universal assembly with a very clear-cut logo or motto. Uh, the church is always by you. This is the motto that has been accompanying our work throughout the years. But this is the key message. The church is always with you. The church is always by your side. The church is not only the buildings that we have, but it's also about the people that we have scattered all over the world, Ukrainians and not Ukrainians. Those people that feel Ukrainian by spirit, those people that are faithful to our church with great love and passion for Ukraine. So the church will be standing by you during the Easter celebrations. As it has already been mentioned, we have received specific and clear-cut recommendations. Uh, all the monasteries, the churches and clergy were instructed to organize their Easter church services in line with the martial law requirements and regulations. We asked the local priesthood to take into account some sensitive issues because there might be an air raid alert any time and we are responsible for the safety and security of our faithful. Therefore, we have a clear awareness of the necessity for having all the measures in place to provide safety and security for the believers, especially in case of an airstrike threat. So the primary emphasis will be placed on the safety and security of the faithful. We can change the time for the traditional Easter vigil and Easter church service, and we can even start our church services at 7 p.m. on Saturday. It's important to start as early as possible so that the, all Christians can participate in the Easter celebration because we will have our Easter liturgy. We do not have to wait until midnight. We will start at about 7 p.m. because we want to have less crowds we want to encourage all the churches to have additional church services. This will help us uh, avoid crowds uh, and at the same time, let everyone participate. We have a multitude of uh, IDPs and refugees. We also understand that a lot of Ukrainians are outside of our country right now. To this end, we are going to have an online broadcast of our Easter services and liturgy. So the faithful will be able to distantly participate in our joint prayer. There is another important aspect that we experienced during the pandemic. Some Easter baskets and Easter food packages. Maybe not everyone can put together an Easter basket. Not, maybe not everyone can afford it under the circumstances, but the most important thing is our unwavering faith, our faith in God who gave us the gift of life and light. So even if you don't have Easter bread, it's not a big deal. It's enough to just get together and express your gratitude to God. Won't it be Easter? Of course it will be Easter because Easter is not only about traditions. Easter is not only about the physical and tangible things that we can see. Easter first and foremost is about our faith. During the online broadcast, we will also articulate some prayers so that you will have your Easter basket blessed. You don't have to go to church and have the priest bless your Easter basket because it's all about 
sharing this gift together. We are ready to meet people halfway. We are ready to utilize all available communication channels to communicate information to our faithful. We will provide information on the nearest shelters in case of air raid alerts. How is the life of our church different? I think that we can see it right now because uh, the church has to go beyond its traditional services and liturgies. The church has to be by the side of people, those people who are suffering, those people who are in need of material need. So the church will always be with you no matter where you are. Father, you are the chaplain of Lviv City Council and there's a special mission on your shoulders to bless and inspire your fighters. What do you tell them? It's very important to say thank you. Each and every fighter feels the inner need and duty to defend their country. They feel this inner impulse to go to the front line and protect the life of their families, of their motherland. And they are doing it not out of the, their of the duty. They are doing it with enormous love towards Ukraine and all its citizens. That's why it's crucial to say thank you, Defender. Thank you for the sacrifice that you are ready to make. Maybe you are sheltering somewhere. You're not really sure whether you will be able to meet the next morning, to meet the next dawn. Hence, it's crucial to say thank you. But apart from expressing gratitude, we also need to secure a robust home front. We need to continue our work in such cities as Lviv. Our defenders need to feel and know that their dear ones are in safety, that their wives, moms, and children are taken care of by society, that they have not been abandoned, that they have not been left on the sidelines. Each and everyone has to contribute to the defenses of our country. As clergy, we appeal to God and we are operating on a spiritual front. We have this uh, perpetual spiritual marathon. There's one phenomenon that has evolved within our church. At 8 p.m., our church scattered around the world gets together for the joint rosary prayer. It's a unique phenomenon. People from Ukraine, European countries, Australia, the USA, Canada, you name it, join online to pray for our defenders, to pray for our victory. This is the victory that will bring peace to our country. We cannot be talking about the victory at any price because the price is already very high. We are paying the price of human lives, the lives of our sisters and brothers, uh, fathers and mothers. So it's crucial to say a big thank you to our defenders. We are grateful for having you. We are here. We are working here on the ground for you to have a safe place to come back to. And even when God calls you into eternity, the life that you will sacrifice for Ukraine will not be to no avail. We will bend over backwards to help Ukraine resurrect. It has already resurrected. We're just waiting for this Easter morning. But this Easter morning will definitely come thanks to you, our dear defenders. So this is something that is part and parcel of all the prayers announced by our faithful. I also want to ask a question to Father Sivak. Can you tell us more about what has changed since February the 24th? February the 24th is a day that came as a shock to each and every Ukrainian because the troops of the aggressor crossed our border the church and each and every priest joined forces. 
the church is not only about clergy. The church is also about people. So everyone put up defenses. The military are fighting in the military front line. We know that there is also a diplomatic front. And there is another front, the spiritual one, the front of prayers. This is the front that has transformed the work of the clergy. We know that within the armed forces of Ukraine, there are chaplains. These are military priests who are side by side with our service members. A lot of them are fulfilling their duties in the front line. They organized liturgies and church services there. They offer spiritual support for our defenders because uh, it's important to maintain the combat spirit of our military. We can see in the mass media that chaplains are also engaged in escorting humanitarian convoys and they are fulfilling other pastoral duties under war conditions. Each and every parish has transformed into a humanitarian hub. Priests and their parishioners collect humanitarian aid and provide it to the needy. We are also taking care of the internally displaced. The church is taking care of them. Some of the church premises and facilities are used as accommodation places for IDPs and refugees. For example, there is a dorm of the Lviv Orthodox Theological Academy. And this dorm has been converted to, into a safe haven for IDPs. And we really hope that they can find peace and comfort there. So let me reiterate that each and every priest is serving as a volunteer in each and every community has been transformed into a humanitarian hub. Thank you, Father. So let me uh, introduce our guests again, Mikhaila Sivak, the key holder of the um, Orthodox Church of Ukraine, Mr. Pavlo Drozdyak, chaplain of Lviv City Council and press secretary of Lviv Eparchy of the Ukrainian Creek Catholic Church. And Mr. Yvan Boyko, Mayor's Chief of Staff. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for being with us. Thank you for the spiritual inspiration and for important information. Is there a question? Please go ahead. Um, Adriana, New York Times. I have a question to the clergy. Are you observing? an increased number of visitors uh, in your churches in the past two months. The pandemic stole people away from the church because people were frightened. The war did the opposite. Because of the war, uh, people are back in churches and temples. We do understand that our great hope lies with God He's our creator, and he can help us experience and weather through everything. People are in need of spiritual support. Many people, after the beginning of hostilities, are struggling from a psychological perspective. And a lot of people do not go to psychologists. They go to church because they are in need of the prayer. And we have a well-elaborated process flow. First and foremost, we need to be by these people. We need to help them open up and extricate them from this dire mental condition. We need to help them reconcile with their condition. Maybe they're also overflowing with anxiety, but it's very important to be by their side. You don't really want to hover over them. You don't really want to tell them what to do during wartime. I'm also living during the war, so let's weather through this war together. So you are right, we have been observing an increased number of the faithful in churches. We can also see 
multiple IGPs in our temples. And we can see that they also require this spiritual communication with God. And I can see that they are taken aback by our friendliness, the hospitality of the clergy, because uh, they come to church to have some tea with us. There are little children who come to church with their moms. And our task is to lend a helping hand to this little child that experienced the bombardment, that might have witnessed human deaths and losses. We want to help them understand what is happening around. Not only are we praying over these children, but we try to be on their level. We share some goodies with them. We play some games with them. So my point is that the church has to be as open as possible because we need to provide uh, the best service to the people who come to us. Thank you for the answer. And uh, I have another question. Are there any losses uh, among the chaplains, uh, among the clergy? And is there any damage to the church property? If yes, then where and what is this damage? You are right. Uh, there are losses among the clergy, you might have seen in the mass media that to the best of my memory, about four priests have lost their lives. These are the priests that served in the front line. They include chaplains. And there's one friend of mine, Father Paton Morhonov. He was also a chaplain. So we can see that the occupiers who assaulted our soil do not care about anything. They are ready to kill civilians. They are ready to exterminate the clergy. We are aware of a large number of churches and temples that have sustained damage as well. So there's nothing sacred for the aggressor. Any other questions? for the church leaders. Um, last Friday, uh, at the insistence of the Holy Father, Pope Francis, uh, Ukrainians were shocked to see that uh, during the Way of the Cross procession held in Rome, the cross was held jointly by two women, one Russian and one Ukrainian. And this was done uh, at the insistence, again, of the Holy Father to symbolize reconciliation and hope for peace. Um, Immediately afterwards, uh, the Ukrainian Catholic Patriarch Sviatoslav said publicly that the gesture of holding the cross together was, quote, inappropriate and ambiguous and does not take into account the con ton context of Russian military aggression against Ukraine. Do you agree with Patriarch Sviatoslav that the Pope was wrong to do this uh, to insist on this act. I can't but agree with our patriarch, with the leader of our church. We are experiencing enormous anguish and it's not the right time to be talking about this format of reconciliation, this way of communication. It's not timely because we are experiencing some horrendous events and we cannot be talking about achieving peace at any price because this price is very high. We are already paying a high price. So the church is with the people and the people are with the church. We cannot have a compromise with our conscience. We cannot reach a compromise with some diplomatic levers because this is their way of presenting a model of forgiveness and a model of reconciliation. We are on the pathway and this pathway will be thorny, but we will definitely finish the journey. Um, from the city administration. Um, on social media, there are reports that uh, 
On social media, there are reports that the Russians are preparing to target churches during the Easter celebrations, possibly through the use of infiltrators or other people. Uh, do you take these threats seriously that uh, places of worship may be targeted, uh, sadly targeted during the Easter celebrations? Thank you. Thank you for your question. I have already mentioned that we don't have a single safe city in Ukraine. And horrific airstrikes on Lviv on Monday are a testimony to that. This week is the week before Easter, and it started with some horrific missile strikes on the city of Lviv. You are aware of the dead and the injured that we have in our hospitals. The city of Lviv, together with the Lviv Regional Military Administration, has had a number of meetings on safety and security in our city as part of Easter celebrations. So we will do everything it takes to ensure the safety and security in our city so that we will have a safe Easter celebration. But once again, keep in mind that we are living during wartime. So the vigilance of each and every citizen has to be very high. Thank you. And taking advantage of this opportunity, I would like to say something else. I would like to express my gratitude to all the churches in the city of Lviv. As our fathers have already mentioned, Lviv churches have become volunteering and humanitarian hubs in Ukraine. The Ukrainian church has always played a crucial role in our statehood, and this dire period is not an exception. Upwards of 100 churches in Lviv have become safe shelters for refugees and IDPs, and as the fathers mentioned, each and every church has been converted into accommodation for IDPs and refugees. So my heartfelt gratitude goes to you, your efforts, the efforts of the clergy and parishioners will contribute significantly to our joint victory. Yvo Boyko, Pavlo Drzdiak, and Father Mikhailo Savak, thank you for being with us today. Thank you for spiritual inspiration and important information. This is media.
Dear ladies and gentlemen, my name is Andriy Shevchenko. On behalf of the Media Center Ukraine team, I would like to welcome all the journalists who are telling the entire world about our fight for freedom. Next to me in our Media Center, you can see the fragments of the Russian combat airplane Su-34, which means that we are going to be talking about the battle in the Ukrainian sky, we will be talking about Ukrainian aviation and its successes within this war. But before we get started, I would like to um, show a video Please clip on this initiative. Дякуючи тобі, в своєму рідному українському небі я не дам московицькому окупанту бомбити мою землю та вбивати наших дітей, жінок та літні. З твоєю допомогою, хто б ти не був, олігарх, бізнесмен, айтішник, Актор чи співак якої національності чи країни, я захищу від цієї чуми українське небо і не дозволю їй прийти на твоє. Купи мені літак. На його борту я буду малювати зірочки збитих нами з тобою літаків нелюдей, які скидали вакуумні та касетні бомби на житлові будинки, школи та дитячі садочки. Як небесна кара, я знищу танки, бронетехніку та військових злочинців окупантів. Вони не врятуються ні від мене, ні від тебе, ні від народного та божого гніва. І на оновленій землі врага не буде супостата. І буде син, і буде мати, і будуть люди на землі. Купи мені літак. Yuri Nazaruk, co-founder of Aviacia Halicini brand and one of the initiators of the Buy Me a Fighter Jet initiative. Why did you decide to start raising funds to buy fighter jets for the Ukrainian Air Forces? Good afternoon. The Aviacia Halicini brand has been working with different um, Air Force brigades for a long time. We have been supporting a wide array of initiatives and we could not remain on the sidelines. Because on the one hand, we can see the despair of people. They are claiming that they need fighter jets to protect our sky. But on the other hand, we are feeling a great feeling of pride because these people are ready to sacrifice their lives to protect our sky. So the combat pilot, pilots who initiated this uh, event cannot be actively engaged. Therefore, we created a charitable fund to implement what you've seen in the video clip. So we want to find these fighter jets. We want to raise funds on different accounts, and then we will be able to achieve the main goal of the initiative. Mr. Serhi Drozdov, commander of the Air Force of Ukraine's Armed Forces from 2015 to 2021. Serhi, could you please explain the importance of this initiative nowadays? On February the 24th, uh, our life was transformed drastically. And back then, we all, pilots and the military, started defending our country. Unfortunately, this assault was sudden and brutal. Airplanes were destroyed in the air and on land. If we have a look at the current state of play, at the beginning of the war, the ratio was uh, one to nine. By now, we have already destroyed twofold more aircraft of the enemy than the enemy has downed our aircraft, but we've lost some of our fighter jets as well. So if we are talking about the effectiveness of downing the enemy aircraft, we are twofold more effective, but day in, day out, we are losing our planes as well. And even 
with this positive and upward trend, even with the effective operations of our pilots, the ratio is 1 to 8 now. For example, 100 airplanes uh, of the Air Force and 500 planes uh, of the Air Force of the Russian Federation. So the ratio is 1 to 5. If we have destroyed 100 aircraft, um, they have destroyed 50 aircraft, we've been twofold more effective, but we have uh, only 50 combat effective aircraft left while they have 400 left. So there's a constant need for replenishing um, our air fleet. And I would like to add one more point. We want to be provided with those aircraft that we know how to fly, that we know how to operate 127, 125, but our potential is declining right now. And while appealing to partner countries, we call upon them to help us ramp up uh, our air potential. We need to have access to state-of-the-art aircraft that can shoot at a longer distance and that can be more effective. We have a Ukrainian war pilot live with us. We will not disclose his name, but I have a very simple question. What kind of airplane do you need? Uh, good afternoon, glory to Ukraine. Yes, we are in need of fighter jets and airplanes, but uh, we also have some aircraft, we, but we need state-of-the-art modern aircraft. We know what to do with these fighter jets. Glory to Ukraine, glory to Heroes. Are there any questions from the audience? Please go ahead. Good afternoon, uh, Andriana. I represent New York Times. What kind of aircraft are you planning to purchase? What is the price of one fighter jet? And where are you planning to buy the aircraft? Uh, thank you for this question. If you represent New York Times, it would be very good for our message to be communicated to the USA. You've heard our pilot. This is the pilot who is flying during this war. We are ready to fly fighter jets, more powerful and modern fighter jets from our partner countries. Yes, they are expensive. They, like these Russian fighter jets, cost about 50, 60 million, but we can squeeze out even more from the obsolete aircraft and hence the positive outcomes of our air operations. The Air Force of Ukraine, the Ministry of Defense, are interested in procuring these fighter jets. We're not really talking about any specific cost right now. Without the political decision, we cannot really do anything. You've heard multiple addresses by our president. We are in need of surface-to-air missile systems. We are in need of fighter jets that will close our sky. I would like to remind everyone that the day before yesterday, Lviv was hit. There were missile strikes and these missiles were fired uh, by the fighter jets of the Russian Federation. Yuri, please go ahead. The key is that we have certainty in the fact that the Ministry of Defense is doing its utmost to receive fighter jets from partner countries. Uh, but there's a lot of politics involved. Some countries are afraid of supplying us with aircraft while other countries are sitting on the fence. But the point is that we want to create opportunities for private donors and benefactors to contribute. So basically, this fund can procure a fighter jet, and then this fighter jet or several fighter jets can be transferred to the Air Force of Ukraine's armed forces. Basically, it's not an easy task. Uh, one moment. We'll make sure we have uh, the transcript. 
So my colleague can translate also, if needed. Um, so it's not an easy task. You're talking about buying me a jet and, uh, you know, regarding this uh, international laws and stuff. Do you have any plan already placed? That, or if there is any plan? So and uh, your individual support is very important for us. Thank you. I have a question, if I may. It's a question to any of the three participants. We can see enormous successes of Ukrainian pilots in the sky, and I think that it came as a surprise for our enemy and for multiple people globally who are observing the war in Ukraine. What is the secret sauce of the effectiveness of our pilots? I guess this is a question to Mr. Drozdov, and maybe our pilot can respond as well. I will start, and maybe our pilot can compliment. Our pilots, since 2014, to answer this question, whether we would be in favor of imposing this uh, tax or duty, but they have a great chance to demonstrate that they are genuine Ukrainians, because basically they can invest their money to buy those fighter jets that will be protecting their families and our soil, and then we can sort it out with the tax thing after the war. Considering the experience of World War II, our armed forces, uh, as part of the former Soviet Union, purchased uh, tank convoys and aircraft. And all this was purchased by people who lived in the Soviet Union. And I think that it can serve as impetus for our oligarchs and people globally. We don't want the world to be on the sidelines. We want them to be heavily engaged in what is unraveling in Ukraine right now, because Ukraine is the bulwark of security in the world right now. We are protecting democracy. We are fighting for the good. And if Ukraine fails to uphold and protect these democratic values, then this aggression will proceed further. So we have to join our forces and fight together. There's no sound. Unfortunately, the interpreter cannot hear anything. Uh, good afternoon, uh, German newspaper, Süddeutsche Zeitung. I have the following question. Some news was circulated yesterday that the U.S. is already supplying Ukraine with some fighter jets. Uh, is it reliable information? I want to express my sincere gratitude to all our partner countries who are lending us a helping hand. They are helping us receive anti-missile systems, some portable systems, anti-tank systems. We are already receiving mid-range and long-range anti-aircraft systems. But the issue with aircraft supplies is a work in progress. We have received some spare parts and equipment to restore the existing air friend, but unfortunately, the capacities of our plants and factories are not sufficient. And we have already started rehabilitating our fighter jets and aircraft, even in our military bases and units, but uh, all the help that we have been receiving will definitely be used to upgrade our aircraft. I'm also from BBC. Um, I'm an interpreter. I have the following question. Is there a specific plan? Let's assume that we find a person who is ready to purchase a, a fighter jet. And this person emails you. Do you have a plan in place? What to do, where to buy this fighter jet? I know that on your website, you have a list of countries that have the required models of aircraft. So is there a well-elaborated plan or scheme for a person who would like to join this initiative. The initiative works uh, as follows. This person can make a financial contribution to the fund, and the fund has a list of partners and a list of countries who are ready to sell these fighter jets. And I think that we all are aware of these countries. The task of the fund is to 
bring the scheme to fruition. So we want to raise the funds and then together with the Air Force of Ukraine's armed forces, we will purchase these fighter jets. If you are Elon Musk or Bill Gates, then everything is simple. Everything is simple because a lot of people are debating about how to fly to Mars, but there's a lot of work to be done on this planet. So they have a great opportunity to do something useful and um, fulfill some missions on planet Earth. I have a follow-up question. So let's assume that a person wants to purchase a fighter jet. Uh, they should just uh, donate some money and they don't, don't have to care about anything else. Exactly. That's why we created this fund. So any person from any corner of the globe, a person can make a donation. And then the task of the fund is to find this fighter jet and then um, sign an agreement. It will be a tripartite agreement. And the Air Force of Ukraine Armed Forces will be a party to this agreement. So this initiative um, is being implemented uh, with the involvement of the Armed Forces of Ukraine. To finish it off, I would like to revert to what we started with. We have the fragment of the Russian airplane Su-34. Is anyone ready to share a story of what happened to this fighter jet? What do we know? Well, a lot of uh, fighter jets lose control, and that's why they fall down. But uh, our pilots in the vicinity of Chernihiv region downed this fighter jet. And it makes me very happy because this fighter jet will not cause any damage to our soil and to our people. This fighter jet fell on the outskirts of the city of Chernihiv. And it's definitely raising the spirits of our pilots. It is a source of motivation and inspiration for the population. And this is a powerful force that will definitely impede the aggressor. We can see that they are changing their tactics. They are more cautious and circumspect about entering our territory because in the past they were certain that we didn't have any air defense systems, that we didn't have any fighter jets at our disposal. But now they know that we have um, all these uh, uh, protection means. Thank you. We had a Ukrainian pilot live with us. We cannot disclose his name for security reasons. And here in the media center, we had Mr. Drozdov with us, commander of the Air Force of Ukraine Armed Forces from 2015 to 2021, and Mr. Yurko Nazarov, co-founder of Aviatia Halicheny Brand. Thank you for this conversation and good luck to all of us. Follow our announcements for the tomorrow program. Uh, I'll draw your attention to the orientation session that we are going to complete.